That is why we have, we have become the heart of the Midwest because of our waterways and because of Lake Michigan. We were at one time were able to connect to all of Canada, all of Mexico, and then to both oceans. Um, through the colonization process, our, our Chicago River was remandered and now flows in a different direction, um, which leads to the Gulf of Mexico. So I'd first like to acknowledge that colonization here in Chicago didn't just happen to the people of the land, it also happened to the land itself. Um, today, Chicago is the leading polluter of the Gulf of Mexico because of the way that our river was demanded. Um, but it still remains a sacred space to indigenous people, especially those of the Three Fires Council, the Anishinaabek, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, as long as other, a dozen other different tribes, including the Hotan, the Miami, um, and the one that forced removal here started in the 1700s with the Odawa Nation, which is now Michigan, um, and it continued um, all the way through the Indian Relocation Act of the 1830s, which pushed any Native people who weren't already in reservation lands west of the Mississippi. Today, Chicago and the state of Illinois, though they are, they remain indigenous words from the Anishinaabek language, they uh, have no tribal territories. Um, so we're standing here on unceded land today um, that is being occupied illegally um, since Chicago has been urbanized. I would also like to take a moment to recognize that Chicago, though it, it remains an indigenous name, has a different history than most large cities in our nation. Because even though uh, we only learn the colonized history, the colonized history of Chicago starts with the Potawatomi woman and her husband, Gustavo, who is of black and Haitian descent. So I want to thank you all for coming here. I'm going to let, or not let, but I've asked my, my 16 year old nephew to share a song with you all today um, to ground us in this place. Um, and he's going to introduce himself. My name is Adrian Pochelle. I'm Western Tribute Cree, Chichango Lakota, Black Kid in Santee Sioux. Um, <clears throat> I sing with Shy Nations, or I am a part of Shy Nation Youth Council, and I sing with a, a youth drum called Shiba Mazi, which means New Beginning. <laughs>
Yava anui, yava akiolo, yava apeleleu, alele mamala amanu, ka amanu, kai, ibi pole na kau kau ku, kau ikamala mai, yava anui, yava akiolo, yava apeleleu. Alele mama la amanu o ka amanu kai Ivi pole na kau ka hoku a kau i ka mala mai Iava anui, iava aki o loa, iava apeleleu Alele mama la amanu o ka amanu o kai Ivi pole na kau ka hoku a kau i ka mala mai Ama mawa ona, awe uwa hiti e utaiti e o mataiti e, awe uwa hiti e utaiti e o mataiti e. I just wanted to say mahalo, Lani Aloha, for helping us do our proper protocols, and mahalo to our uh, Hawaiian contingent for helping us also be part of that protocol. Mahalo. That was Leilani Chan. <laughs> it's so important to start well and know where we started. Hello, my name is uh, Randy Reyes. I'm the board president of Kata and the artistic director of Theater Mu, Asian American theater company in the Twin Cities, celebrating our 26th season. Thank you. <laughs> On the shoulders of Rick Shiomi, the founding artistic director. Um, I want to welcome you all to the sixth national Asian American theater conference and festival. First time in Chicago, and uh, we're thrilled to be here and have some special thanks to our partners, um, starting with uh, Victory Gardens, Erica, Danielle. It's Danielle, right? Not Daniel? Daniel. It's Daniel. <laughs> Erica, Daniel. It's hard to tell in just reading. Uh, and Cheyu and staff. Uh, Silk Road Rising with Jamil, Malik, and Corey. Thank you. Our generous funders, including the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, the National Endowment of the Arts, Artworks, Theater Communications Group, Latinx Theater Commons, and NEFA. And also our host today, uh, the DePaul University School of Theater. And from there, I'd like to introduce Dean John Colbert to say a few words. Thank you, Randy. Good morning. And welcome to the theater school. And thank you for the recognition of the land that we occupy with this building. And um, this is our fifth year in, this, in our new 
uh, home here in this, this uh, facility. And happily in those five years, we've dinged it up a bit. So it feels a bit more theatrical. It now has some stories to tell. Like the time on Christmas Day when the pipe froze and nobody was around to know that water was running everywhere. But that's a story for another time. <laughs> We've learned a bit about the impact of this building on our school, our students, and ourselves in those five years. First, when you walk in the door and sense the, the specialized beauty that comes from the very specialized and dedicated nature of the building, not unlike a barn or a steel mill or a concert hall. You get the feeling that they take this enterprise seriously here, and we do. And that enterprise is the making of theater artists. We know we are privileged to have the kind of support this enterprise requires from DePaul, from the philanthropic community, from our alums, and from the families of our students. And with privilege comes responsibility. And we take that seriously as well. And that leads us to today. This building enables us to have you here to do your work. The work you do, this convening of Asian American theater artists and development of new voices and new plays could not be more relevant to the goals of the theater school and our dreams for our students as they create our future. Now, I'd not be doing my job as dean if I didn't tell you about a few of the things that we're excited about here at the theater school. We're starting a comedy arts program this year and a projection design program. We're also starting a summer high school theater festival that will use Chicago as a classroom and represent the values of the school to that generation of theater artists. On behalf of the entire theater school community, thank you for being here. Thank you for all who work so hard to make this happen. It is not easy to pull this off. And thank you for your commitment to Asian American work in our theaters, new work in our theaters, and underrepresented voices in our theaters. Have a great Confest. Enjoy Chicago. Kata's mission is to advance the field of Asian American theater through a national network of organizations and artists. We collaborate to inspire learning and sharing of knowledge and resources to promote a healthy, sustainable artistic ecology. As a collective of Asian American theater leaders and artists, we bring together local and regional leaders to work nationally towards our shared values of social justice artistic diversity, cultural equity, and inclusion. We hold national conferences and festivals biennially in different parts of the country, reaching as wide a range of Asian American populations and communities as possible. We survey Asian American theater artists and organizations to find out their foremost concerns. We form alliances with other theater groups of different affinities to advance mutual goals cooperatively and to exchange ideas and strategies. The last confest at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival was about seismic shifts in Asian American theater. It intentionally sought the inclusion of other voices into the movement and movement building. This included cross-sector work around refugees and new immigrants to this country, building consensus and challenging us to expand our perception of our cultures. This year's conference Revolutionary Acts continues to build momentum, is inclusionary in nature, and hopes to disrupt systemic and structural oppression and create a new vision built by, about, and for us in this room. That's okay. Yes, it's early. <laughs> We're just getting warmed up. It's all good. <laughs> right now, we are taking action around immigration, xenophobia, unjust incarceration, detainment, and expulsion. We are taking action around Black Lives Matters. We are building coalitions of people of color, Native, and Indigenous peoples. We are taking direct action around Yellowface, Blackface, Brownface, Redface, Cripface, and Transface. 
We are challenging each other in this space created by, for, and about us. In this conference, we're exploring the question of what it means to take direct action and to look at your participation here as a revolutionary act. At this time, I'd like to introduce two of our board members, Leilani Chan, Chan who you met earlier, and Andy Meyer. Aloha, aloha kakahiaka, aloha. Um, my name is Leilani Chan, I come from Los Angeles and I am the Artistic Director of Theater Productions. Um, I'm Andy Meyer and I uh, was born in Hawaii. I am Native Hawaiian, mixed Native Hawaiian and I run a small organization called Tradewind Arts in Kansas City, Missouri. And as you know, my first name is uh, Hawaiian but I actually don't have Native Hawaiian blood. And so on that, I, before we get started with our keynote, Andy and I want to kind of prep you for the keynote. So if you guys could, uh, a la Larissa Fast Horse Inspiration, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and visualize for a moment. Um, I made this up because <laughs> um, visualize, I know that you're, you see, you hear Hawaii and you think about that vacation that you had, or you're gonna have, or you wish one day you could go dream have. It's a lovely, lovely thought. Put that in a box, close the box, wrap it up, tie it with a string, put it on the side. For my Asian American friends here, those of you who have been to Hawaii and had that euphoric experience of finally being in a place where you are in the majority, take that wonderful, pleasant, inspiring, empowering thought, put it in a box, close the box, wrap it up with a string, and put it on the side. I'm here to tell you that our next conversation isn't about any of those lovely memories and thoughts. This is about the people who are of the land in Hawaii who are not in the majority in Hawaii now. And we are here to witness and be blessed by their conversation and their interest in the perpetuation of their culture, their language, and as theater practitioners, as our colleagues. Open your eyes. Wanna add anything? Sure. Um, as an artist of Hapa, Native Hawaiian descent, um, it is very deeply meaningful for me to be able to welcome our artists here today. And when I think back about um, the history of my family and how colonization affected them. And if you know anything about Hawaiian and indigenous cultures, you know that your name is, it's your identity, it's part of who you are, it's your roots, it's your trunk, it's your growth. And my family was so colonized that my grandfather had a hard time passing on his Hawaiian heritage in the form of a name to his own children. And so what we're about to talk about, language reclamation, arts participation, self-representation and empowerment is to me the heart of why we are all here in this room. So I have great pleasure in introducing to you Tamihaili Opua Baker. My kakahiaka nui poni poni, a i ka vehena kaiao, a ke ao laula hoi, a pua lena, a ao loa, he o lino lino aloha ke ia ia o ko apau. Mai nā kai e valu o ka moana nui o kanaloa, 
o ale nui ha ha o ala la keiki o au au o pai lolo o kahi au a o ka ie ie o waho a o ka ula kahi aloha pela ano i ho e mai nei nei a aina o ka po e o iwi o nei no leila he aloha ke ia ia o ko e na po e o iwi o nei a aina ka po e noho o ni pa ana ma ko o ko aina i loko no ka ke kolo nai o iana mai ke la ki hi o ka hale a ke ia ki mai ke la ku kulo ka hale a ke ia ku kulo mai ke la kala a ke ia kala mai ke kanaka iki a ke kanaka nui he aloha nui ke ia ia o ko he me kavelina o ke aloha ke ia ia o ko aloha mai kako he wahi leo mahalo ke ia uh, traveling across the vast seas of Kanaloa, Kalamai, we Kanaka Maoli have come here to share our works, and we are grateful for the inclusion to be at the table with you all and to share our works. Um, I'd like to recognize the indigenous people of this land and the aina that we congregate on here today, this, this morning. I also want to express my warm gratitude to those who opened up the space for us today so that we would be comfortable um, as malihini in your space. Uh, so mahalo for that. Uh, I also want to mahalo everyone who organized the conference. A uh, special mahalo to those who invited me to come and be able to share the works that we do in Hawaii. Uh, I also want to say mahalo and aloha to my fellow Kanaka Maoli in the house. Mahalo for making the journey as well. And for those of you who are living on the continental U.S., onipa'a, yeah, malama mau ika ike kupuna, yeah. Um, so, uh, also aloha to the, the the guests who are here today, yeah, our esteemed speakers, and as well as each and every one of you who have come to take part in this conference where we get to celebrate revolutionary acts. So aloha kakayaka kako, aloha. The pahu hopo, or the goals of this uh, talk this morning, it's gonna be a little bit academic, a little bit kalamai, yeah? Um, I wear that hat as well, so kalamai. Uh, so basically, I wanna provide uh, an abridged history, very much abridged history, of Hawaii in order to contextualize the work that we do, the creative work we do. And then we'll look at um, the cultural renaissance of the 1970s, focusing on the revitalization of the Hawaiian language. And finally, we'll look at theater in Hawaii, what's happening, and we'll focus on hanakeaka, which is Hawaiian medium theater. So this term comes up, yeah, Hawaiian, native Hawaiian, and the term, I'm just going to clarify, it's a term that was created by the United States government to refer to a member or a descendant of the people who before 1778 occupied and exercised sovereignty in the area that now comprises the state of Hawaii. The term Kanaka Maoli has been popularized as the appropriate indigenous term for Native Hawaiian advocates of Native Hawaiian indigenous rights, sovereignty movements and independence, as well as Kanaka Maoli scholars and academics. So Kanaka Maoli are gene uh, genealogically connected to the aina or to the land. The origins of Kanaka Maoli are recorded in our Genesis stories. This, the Genesis stories illustrate this intrinsic connection to the aina. For example, the story of Papahanao Moku, Earth Mother, and Wakea Sky Father expresses the spiritual connection that exists from primordial times for all Kanaka. Traditional society in Hawaii was based on religion. The couple system instituted restrictions and prohibitions based on religious beliefs and nature. The system developed a very well-ordered efficient and practical world, creating a codified social order, provisions on food consumption, fishing seasons, farming practices, ceremony, rituals, and performance. Kanaka Maoli survival was based on the resources available on each island. 
Therefore, the environment was treated with reverence. Key to sustainability was traditional spirituality, which encompassed sorry, the, the worship of all elements of nature, air, wind, rain, rivers, springs, ocean, sun, mountains, trees, volcano, fire, and so forth. Kanaka Maoli established a complex, sophisticated society with an intricate system of governance, a high sense of political engagement, a heiau or temple complex for ritual practices, emphasizing the spiritual connection to the land and our gods. Exquisite arts, games, crafts, intellectual debate, performances, were all produced for seasonal celebrations. Like many indigenous peoples of the Pacific, Kanaka Maoli come from an oral society. Knowledge was fortified, preserved, and per perpetuated through the rich legacy of oral tradition. Kanaka Maoli from all walks of life were composed poetry regularly both in the secular world and in the religious or ritual practices. In this tr thriving oral society, my pigeon is coming out, you guys heard that? <laughs> Kalamai, I turn to be all professional, Manei. Okay, all right. In this thriving oral society, the composition and performance of poetry was a dynamic thread of personal expression that made the tapestry of the Kanaka Maoli world. And then came Captain James Cook. With gifts of sexually transmitted diseases, <laughs> medals, nails, guns, and so forth. And all jokes aside, it is generally accepted that this initial contact with Cook beginning in 1778 was the major catalyst for a societal change and the decline of the Kanaka Maoli world. This marks the onset, onset of colonization as Cook's arrival preempts the subsequent influx of po'e haole, or foreigners. But our ancestors took care of Cook <laughs> <laughs> on Valentine's Day nonetheless. <laughs> So while people are celebrating love and new romance, we Kanaka celebrate the death of Captain Cook. <laughs> yeah. Please do not get the impression that I'm trying to romanticize traditional Kanaka society because there was trouble in paradise. Many Kanaka died during King Kamehameha's quest to unite the islands under one kingdom and those from Kauai, like myself, never conceded. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, in King Kamehameha's passing, the couple system is broken when his wife, the paramount chiefess, Ka'ahumanu, eats with her son, Liholiho, their son, Liholiho, in public in December of 1819. The struggle to reinstate that kapu would be a source of a massive war, numerous deaths, and even divisions between siblings. In March of 1820, the Protestant missionaries arrived on the shores of Hawaii to spread the, their message of Christianity. Christian missionaries perceived the ritual dances, the prayers, the chants, incantations of Kanaka Maoli as acts of idolatry and heathenism. Traditional performance and cultural practices that honored a pantheon of gods were likened to dark pagan worship. The missionaries demanded a complete ban of chant and dance as a, me as a means to dismantle Kanaka Maoli religious practices. This was coupled with massive, massive efforts to empower the Christian church and ways of white enlightenment. This attempt to overturn traditional Kanaka Maoli performance was motivated by religious supremacy, which was synonymous with political power. 
To aid their efforts, the missionaries also pushed for a literary society, first translating the Bible and then teaching Kanaka Maoli to read and write. Kanaka Maoli embraced and excelled in the new technology of print. Kaui Keauli, Kamehameha III, proudly declared, He Aupuni Palapala Ko'u, my kingdom is literate. His declaration drove his people to rapidly acquire written literacy. In February 1834, the initial edition of Kalama Hawaii, which I have here, was the first newspaper to be printed west of the Rocky Mountains. Within two generations from the establishment of a written language, Hawaii had the highest literacy rate in any, of any country in the world, with over 90% of the population able to read and write. With the establishment of Christian schools and the growth of trading in the islands, the Haole settler community increased across the island chain. Soon, those Haole settlers would enter the political scene attempting to influence new legislation, policies in the kingdom, and the establishment and development of Western commerce in Hawaii. On January 17, 1893, a committee of 13 white businessmen read a proclamation establishing themselves as the provisional government and seized control over government and crown lands without conveyance, but through revolt. They imprisoned our queen, demanding her to abdicate her throne. Queen Liliuokalani refused to recognize the illegitimate government, submitting her formal protests to the United States in writing. In December 1893, United States President Cleveland addressed the US Congress, stating that the seizure of the Hawaiian kingdom was a self-proclaimed crime of high treason led by the likes of Sanford B. Dole, the president of the provisional government. Dole Cannery, anybody been to the maze? Connected to this one very individual, okay? Unfortunately, President Cleveland's request for the restoration of the queen did not happen, and his withdrawal of the annexation treaty would resurface under a new administration. Contrary to popular belief, Kanaka Maoli did mobilize to oppose the annexation to, to, of Hawaii to the United States. Political resistance expanded through the formation of the organization of Hui Kalai Aina and Hui Aloha Aina. These organizations led protests, rallies, meetings, and petitions asserting their rights for self-governance. I want to highlight that in 1896, the illegitimate provisional government abolished the Hawaiian medium school system in Hawaii. They banned the language from being spoken. And in 1898, through the annexation, they seized 1.8 million acres of government and crown lands from the kingdom of Hawaii. One of our foremost activists of Kanaka Maoli rights and proponents for self-determination, how Nani K. Tras got it right when she exclaimed, We are not American! We are not American! We are not American! We will die as Hawaiians! We will never be Americans! The 1970s was a time of revolution, a time of protests and rallies to create serious change for the status of Kanaka Maoli. A prime example of this is the Aloha Aina movement to stop the bombing of the US Navy on Kaho'olawe, which was taken for bombing and target practice for many years from the 1940s. This very political Aloha Aina movement had a domino effect on various aspects of Hawaiian rights and movements such as the modern day sovereignty movement, the resurrection of traditional navigation on the double hauled canoe, the hokulea, as well as the growth of halau or hula schools throughout the Hawaiian archipelago. At the heels of the cultural renaissance, 
was the reemergence of the Hawaiian language, Olelo Hawai'i. This cultural revolution and the rise of Kanaka Maoli consciousness likely saved Olelo Hawai'i from extinction. Political uprising fueled protests and lobbying for the language, resulting in the reinstatement of Olelo Hawai'i as an official language of the state in 1978. Soon thereafter, we see the establishment of Hawaiian immersion preschools modeled after the Maori Kohangareo beginning on the island of Kauai. For Kanaka Maoli, the choice to Olelo Hawai'i in our homeland is a political choice. We position ourselves as the native people of our aina, claiming our sovereignty through speaking our language. We know that in order for our culture to survive, we need our language. However, the key to survival of a language is the expansion of domains for our language to be practiced in. The practice of Hawaiian medium theater, Hanakiaka, a movement in itself, empowering Kanaka Maoli identity while reclaiming history and space. Hanakiaka shares the stories of our ancestors and addresses political issues faced throughout the generations that continue to resonate today. The retelling of our stories is a means to reconnect to our roots. We carry our ancestors on our shoulders as we navigate through the turbulent seas as cultural and language warriors braving the battlefield. I want to pause here on Hanakiaka just to take a brief look at the theater landscape in Hawaii. We have theaters that address specific genres of theatrical performance, such as the mainstream theater, producing musicals and, and plays from off-Broadway at, at Diamond Head Theater, Manoa Valley Theater. We also have theater for young audiences, such as Honolulu Theater for Youth and other college programs. Then we have an Asian theater program, mostly out of the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where forms of Japanese, Chinese, and Indonesian theater take center stage. Dance theater of varying genres are very visible in Hawaii. Then we have local theater. We classify it as local theater, mostly produced at Kumukahua Theater, whose mission is to produce plays of Hawaii by Hawaii playwrights. We also have local Asian theater, exemplified in the works of Edward Sakamoto and Daryl Lum. Then there is a movement of ethnic theater, other than Asian. Pacific Islanders in the arts with their Samoan create oriented creative works, or Katipunan uh, with the Filipino language and literature program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We have Hawaiian theater and Hanakiaka. Now there's often crossover of genres, of theater, of artists, of playwrights, directors, who go pretty fluidly with all of these venues that um, I've mentioned here. Inamona Theater Company's work is a prime example of Hawaiian theater which is theater of Hawaiian content, written by a Kanaka Maoli playwright, very often featuring Kanaka Maoli actors. Both Hawaiian theater and Hanakiaka share many similar characteristics. Hawaiian theater is predominantly produced in English, however, it includes Olelo Hawaii. I'd be remiss if I wouldn't mention Hanakiaka hula, or hula drama, a distinguished halau hula, halau kekuhi, accounts for eight generations of kumuhula in their lineage. Internationally recognized for their artistic contributions, halau kekuhi produced eight theatrical productions based on their Pele lineage. Since 1995, their productions have formalized the genre of Hawaiian dance theater, a form deeply rooted in hula genealogy. Utilizing primarily dance and chant, each performance is a recitation of travels, challenges, and triumphs of, their, of an ancestor of theirs or an ancestral hula deity. The term hanakiaka, 
I'll let you enjoy the photo. I'll take my time on this one. Yeah. Okay. In its current incarnation, Hanakiaka recounts traditional mythologies and historical events, typically classified as mo'olelo. The stories communicated in these Hanakiaka productions are drawn from oral tradition and Hawaiian literary texts, often extracted from the Hawaiian language newspapers published between 1834 through 1948. Sorry, gang, we've got to move forward. Okay. Hanakiaka are based on traditional mo'olelo depicting ancestors and historical figures as characters in these productions. Frequently, those involved with the productions are genealogically connected to the characters portrayed. This familial connection creates a sense of res responsibility and accountability on the part of the cast members, the artistic team, and the playwright to present authentic representations of this mo'olelo adapted for the stage and their ancestors. Hanakeaka also interweaves hanano'eo with dialogue. These traditional performance forms are utilized as dramatic structural devices that create an indigenously Hawaiian aesthetic. The performances utilize Hawaiian language as its medium. The four pillars listed here Mo'olelo, Ku'auhau, Hananoeo, and Olelo Hawai'i constitute the foundation of Hanakiaka. In Hawaiian medium theater, our dialogue is supported by traditional performance forms. Projected here is a list of those forms. It's not exclusively, this is not exclusively what we use, but this is the foundation for most of what we use. We have pule, Oli, which are chants that are not danced to. Yeah, we don't dance to Oli, we dance to Mele. Um, Ha'a, called Hula after the 1800s. Lua, Hula Ki'i, which is the dance of images done by performers with, or with wooden puppets. Kaka Olelo, Ha'imo Olelo, and Ho'opapa. I'll briefly mention here King David La'amea Kalakaua, a true patron of the arts and a staunch supporter of traditional practices. He is one of our earliest theatrical directors. Kalakaua created and organized multiple performances of dance, chant, puppetry, and tableau performances for both his coronation celebration and his golden jubilee. He is our merry monarch. Kanaka Maoli embraced the art of theater, integrating their indigenous genre of performance into a dramatic framework to create Hanakiaka. The traditional performance forms that pre-existed Western contact undeniably created the foundation upon which Hanakiaka was developed, giving birth to an indigenously Hawaiian aesthetic. Here are some examples. In researching the newspapers, I found I found this production on the far left. In 1880, this is the story of Hi'iaka Ikapoli Opele. And on the advertisement for the production, you see the different types of hula that were actually performed and the storytelling that took place. The middle article speaks to uh, an opera, a Hawaiian musical opera for La Ie Kavai in 1902. And then, uh, the advertisement closest to me with the photo of the cast was from 1925. This is the cast of Pele and Lohio, and this production actually toured to Los Angeles and San Francisco out of Oahu. La Ie Kawai is a story that frequently resurfaces as a hanakiaka. In April of 1893, while Queen Lili Okalani was imprisoned, this performance was staged across the street from Iolani Palace, where she was held. The themes of this story resonate with the turmoil that Kanaka Maoli and the nation of Hawaii was experiencing in 1893. 
Perhaps this theatrical performance was an actual political protest by Kanaka Maoli. To retell this story of a woman who is stripped of her power and her status, eventually to be restored by the gods. I wonder if this performance was actually done for our beloved queen. Was Kanaka, this Kanaka Maoli theater group sending her a message to their, their performance of their hopes for her reinstatement? Kahalao Hanakiaka has led the way since 1995 for this modern form of Hawaiian medium theater. Our work has contributed to the Hawaiian language revitalization movement through, the performance, through performances for the immersion school children and the creation of curriculum around these performances. Since its inception, Kahalao Hanakiaka has committed to touring our productions to schools across the Hawaiian archipelago. Through travel grants and funding, we've created access for these mo'olelo, these stories, and the experience of Hawaiian media and theater to more rural Hawaiian communities. The halau was officially established in 1996, shortly after the premiere of our first production in December 1995. This first production, featured here in this picture, um, is an actual picture of the one that this performance was for. The production was called Kalui Ko'olau Ke Ka e a e o Na Pali Kalalau, and it told the life story of Pi'ilani, the woman featured here, and her husband, Ko'olau, who was one of the many Kanaka Maoli stricken with leprosy in 1892. Leprosy was an awful disease that claimed the lives of many Kanaka Maoli in the 19th century. The story goes, Ko'olau and his wife Pi'ilani refused to be forced, se forced separation as deemed by the provisional government to keep those who contracted the disease away from the general population. With their child, who had also contracted the disease, the couple fled to Kalalau Valley for refuge. This one-act play shared the last years of Ko'olau's life, depicting his courage to resist the Haole provisional government and to fight for what he believed in, ohana, family, and aloha, unconditional love. Pi'ilani was a lone survivor who was the lone survivor of the tra tragic deaths of her son, Kale Manu, who died at the age of nine, and her husband, Kalui Ko'olau. After burying both of them, she returned to Kekaha, their homeland, only to be arrested by the provisional government for harboring a fugitive. Since Kalui Ko'olau, Kahalau Hanakiaka has produced more than a dozen Hawaiian language productions and supported efforts at the University of Hawaii at Manoa to produce Hawaiian language plays and curriculum. The value of Hanakiaka is in the retelling of our stories, which present traditional knowledge, practices, beliefs, and lessons to a new generation of Kanaka Maoli, confirming that one, we have our own stories to tell. Two, we are connected to these rich stories. And three, our language is alive and it is a viable means of communication. Besides providing opportunity to be entertained in the medium of Hawaiian, theater, Hawaiian language, Kahalo Hanakiaka holds steadfast to intergenerational knowledge transmission, ancestral knowledge, cultural practices, and the socialization of our people. Each production has been a means to honor our kupuna, our elders, to perpetuate Olelo Hawaii while raising the level of language fluency in the community, and to empower Kanaka Maoli identity. This list is representative of those things in life that are awakened by each production that we do. I'll talk about the most recent achievement of the advancement of the teaching and practice of Hanakiaka, 
which has been the institutionalization of Hanakiaka at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In the fall of 2014, the Department of Theater and Dance established the new Hawaiian theater program, inclusive of a graduate, de uh, graduate degree, not a D, sorry, a graduate degree, a Master's of Fine Arts in Hawaiian Theater. And to my knowledge, this degree, this degree program is the only indigenous graduate degree of its kind in the world. Mahalo. <laughs> you won't be able to see this, so sorry. Program coursework includes the history of theater in Hawaii, the study and analysis of indigenous Hawaiian theater, and training in both traditional and contemporary Hawaiian performance forms. Students now have the opportunity to learn the art form of Hanakiaka and participate in original Hawaiian medium productions. These productions represent and, and honor the language, traditions, history, and values of the Hawaiian community. Two Hanakiaka have been produced since the establishment of the program. La Ie Kawai in 2015, and most recently, Nakawa Hiiaka in 2017. The inaugural main stage production, La Ie Kawai, featured here, toured, oh, sorry, played to sold out audiences on Oahu, and then toured to neighbor islands, uh, the neighbor islands of Kauai, Molokai, and Hawaii. The production also toured to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and was fe a featured showcase production at the Region 8 2016 Kennedy Center College, uh, uh, Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival. Reviews in the local newspapers co commended the production, calling it a cultural and linguistic triumph. Nakawa Hiiaka was written and directed by Kaui Kaina. This was the first Hanakeaka MFA Theist production of our new program. Ms. Kaina graduated in August 2007, making her the first to receive the degree. Both Laie Kawai and Nakawa Hiiaka presented traditional mo'olelo with themes highly re relevant to today's world, evoking strong emotions from audience members. In addition to the theater productions that we've done, the Hawaiian Theater Program has organized an Aha Hanakiaka or Hawaiian Theater Symposium. This symposium held in the fall of 2016 uh, featured presentations on the survey and landscape of Hanakiaka and Hawaiian theater. It also featured short Hanakiaka performances from the kids at the different immersion schools on Oahu. And then we had three focus uh, panels that featured Kanaka Maoli artists, Kanaka Maoli community members, and Kanaka Maoli educators. We finished the day with uh, a community dialogue on the the future of Hanakiaka, talking strategically about what we need to do to further the movement. We also concluded the evening with the 20 year anniversary celebration and reunion to commemorate the establishment of Kahalao Hanakiaka. I'd like to mention that both Laie Kawai and Nakawa Hiiaka are available online and thanks to OEV Television for documenting the productions and doing the post-production editing. Uh, anyone can access these productions at any time in your leisure. Just go ahead and Google Hanakiaka OEV Television or actually go to their website. You can view these, thing, these videos with or without English subtitles as well. Here is a preview of La Ie Kawai. <laughs>
Mahalo. The mole, or ancestral root, foundation of Hanakiaka, are the traditional performance forms that existed since time immemorial. Therefore, Hanakiaka is an innately Kanaka Maoli expression of art that serves the community of Kanaka Maoli. Hanakiaka provides a venue for Kanaka Maoli to articulate their voice, recount their historical events, and promote Hawaiian epistemology, ontology, cultural values, and practices. Performing our stories in our language is a revolutionary act. This act empowers Kanaka Maoli identity, elevates our people, and awakens Kanaka Maoli consciousness for generations to come, which is the reason why we do our work. Eola mau ka olelo Hawaii. Mahalo. So Andy and I are going to just introduce the next panel, if we can hold back the tears. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, you, you first. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Um, so our next panel is going to be um, a continuation of the discussion about the various um, forms of Hawaiian theater. And to moderate it, we have the one and only Sammy Akuna, a.k.a. Coco Chandelier, an incredible theater artist, as you can imagine, who has taught and been a role model for many of us. Coco Chandelier. Come on down, Coco. <laughs> Sitting next to Coco, we have uh, Christopher Morgan, who's the festival artist who has brought his show, Pohaku. And, and with great appreciation, because he's stepping out of tech so he can participate in this conversation. So he ran right over here from uh, Victory Gardens. And then we also have Moses. Um, who uh, of, of Inamoa, who many of us saw last night uh, with Kinolau, and of course our keynote speaker, Kumu Haile Opua Baker. And again, we're setting this up as more of a fishbowl conversation because we really wanted to witness a conversation between all of these four Native Hawaiian artists. 
Um, and we're not going to open up to conversations because we want to hear what they have to say to each other, um, giving us the great privilege to hear their conversation. And we will be around. Um, they will be around. So if you have burning questions, you can ask them later. But we're here to witness their conversation. Mahalo. And I'll give you five minutes, Coco, when it's five minutes to the end. To strip or to do the start? The <laughs> I only need two minutes. We only need two you minutes. You have bingo later, honey. It's okay. <laughs> Aloha, everyone. And I'd like to say thank you to our native representation that came and welcomed us. Mahalo. Um, also to the dean of the school, thank you for creating this safe space for us to explore and challenge and question. And um, also standing on the back of our ancestors, our kupuna, and all of our teachers. Standing without our teachers, we could not provide the work that we are sharing. But most importantly, the stories. It's the stories that we share, that we share amongst each other. Those stories, they have so many cross-contamination with all of us native people, brown people, people of color, Asians, Kanaka Maoli. There's so many of those stories that we connect with on so many levels. So to our playwrights, to our performers, our actors, our dancers. Please keep the, the thriving of our stories alive because that's why we're here. It's theater, it's dance. Um, yeah, so let's start with our panel. So we're just gonna have, so it's very open, it's very relaxed, so if you wanna fart or <laughs> whatever, you know, don't be ashamed. We're, we're kind of in a very open and safe space. So if you gotta, so. Before we start, everyone stand up, please. We're just gonna stretch so you can stretch. We, we got through the academic protocols of Hanakeaka, and we're gonna enjoy the rest of the week and have so much fun with each other. And just, just look to, to either side of yourself, and if you say, see someone, just say aloha, or hello, or hola, or jambo, or whatever, and then look to the other side and say the same, say hi. Because you might not see this person later, or you might be in a scene with them. Who knows? Okay, so we can sit down now. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we're going to start with Christopher K. Morgan. We just met like two minutes ago. So, <laughs> um, so we're going to have... Um, this is just some notes I have. In May 2000 of last year, um, he was named the um, Art Executive Director of Dance Place. Yes, a 37-year-old institution in Washington, D.C. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But now we're gonna get to the nitty gritties. So I like to ask my panelists before we engage them, just so we know a little history about them, and this is just about food. Food always connects us in some way. We all have that and we all share that. Christopher's favorite type of food to eat is, okay, take a wild guess, it's a starch. <laughs> Rice! Rice. So the youngest of eight children in his family, his responsibility was to cook the rice every night. And that is a very big responsibility, as we know, because everyone has to eat rice with their meal. And if you're not eating a meal, you're eating rice. So, um, a favorite smell of his is pikake. Um, his mom grew it in California for them as children. So that smell of pikake, if you know what that smell is, it's a beautiful, rich smell. And that's a little bit about Christopher. We're gonna move off to Moses Goods. Aloha, Moses. We're gonna go backwards. <laughs> his favorite type of food was his dad's barbecue. Only his sister can make that barbecue now. Yeah, make her do all the work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so bring your rice. And uh, have your sister bring the barbecue. <laughs> so, but you're perpetuating theater, so, and, and the stories. His favorite drink or inu is dirty gin martini, a beef eater gin. We didn't get to ask you what your favorite drink was. I like them all. It just depends on the day and the time. 
<laughs> so wet always. Wet and moist always. Moses' favorite or a smell that takes him back is small engine exhaust. <laughs> so his dad would, um, it would remind him of his dad because every summer he would work with him on cars and mechanics and stuff like that. Lawnmowers and stuff. So that smell of small engine exhaust. <laughs> Moses studied at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He's currently an independent theater artist, actor, and playwright. Thank you, Moses. Welcome. And next we move on to Kumu Haleopua Baker. And her favorite food is luau, or just the taro leaf. It's just the leaf of the taro, if you know what the taro leaf is, and kulolo. Um, it's a native Hawaiian dish. It's not my favorite dish, but <laughs> that thing always made me itchy. Because <laughs> I always had to prepare that, and it makes you itchy when you gotta make that. Mm, God, fun it. Okay. <laughs> my pigeon is coming out, so it's okay. <laughs> Her favorite drink or inu is um, vai or water. And when she's feeling colonized and Earl Grey tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's her favorite drinks. <laughs> her favorite smell is the smell of coconut. It reminds her of her childhood making haupia, which is another Hawaiian sweet delicacy with her grandmother. I like haupia. <laughs> you don't get too itchy making that one, so... Uh, she is the Associate Professor and Director of Hawaiian Theatre and Playwriting at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Thank you, Kumu. <laughs> so just a little history of myself, just so you know, I, am a, I will always be a student of, of Kumu Haile Opua Baker. I'm a graduated with a master's degree in Asian theater. Kalamai, everyone on this side. Um, but my foundation was uh, theater dance. My teacher always said that dance is the number one theater before any other theater. And I feel that's true for a lot of Asian theater because dance is the way that we transcribe our stories. Korean hula, um, Jingju, Chinese opera, it was always theater of the dance. Our friends that came to Hawaii a couple years ago, they shared their movement with us. And so I always believe dance is my foundation for theater, as it is for all of us in some art form. And I am currently in the continental US exploring. I had no idea about this conference existing. So it's an honor and privilege to be here and be welcomed into your play space. Thank you so much. It brings me back to why I miss theater so much. And I am... An example of myself, which is Coco Chandelier, who still performs in the continental U.S. because she makes more money than she does in traditional theater. <laughs> and <laughs> so come to my shameless promotion show tonight, which is actually a fundraiser for Kata. Um, we like to offer our mahalos and thanks to, for Kata and the board and everyone for inviting us, Leilani especially, that reached out a few months ago. And I was like, Kata, what is that? <laughs> Never heard of it. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here and sharing the stories last night. Beautiful, so engaging, so much connectivity, so much love, so much drama. Thank you for kicking off the festival for us. And is that my friend Munchkin? You look like my friend. <laughs> and we also have another university student alumni here from Hawaii. So it's so nice to see you. Yeah. OK, so we are going to open up the panel. So. If Let's talk. I'm going to Vala'au. 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 Okay, what you guys like to talk about? Now we're just going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you folks want to share something that you're, like, currently that's in your, your field, what you're doing, like, right now, like, right here and right now. Who would like to begin? <laughs> <laughs> Christopher, mahalo. <laughs> um, well, 
I feel very honored to be able to share my work during this conference with all of you. Um, tomorrow night and Thursday, you'll see this work that in some ways I'm surprised I'm still doing. It premiered in 2016. It had its foundations with um, research and dreams that I were given by my ancestors in 2009. And so it's been a really long journey with this work, Pohaku. Um, so that's what I'm sharing here right now. I'm very grateful, as you already identified, to stand on the shoulders of my ancestors. And my teacher is here with me, um, Kelsey, Elsie, Haliku. Oh my gosh, I think I'm getting nervous. Yeah. <laughs> Elsie Kalehulukea Ryder, and our teacher John Kaimikawa, my late cousin. Um, so it's a real, real pleasure to be here uh, amongst all of you amazing people. Um, something that I've been working on in my research, you'll see um, that work tomorrow, so I won't talk too much about that or Thursday. But I've been really trying to think about next steps. What is the next big project for me? And I'm very curious about the intersection between appropriation and appropriate sharing because I don't want my culture to live in isolation, and I grew up away from my culture. I grew up on the continent in Southern California, uh, grew up with a strong presence of Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaiiana, Hawaiian culture, hula, in my life through my family. Not as strong as um, I would have liked, actually, but it was always there. And so now, as I've integrated that into my work, which has mostly been in Western-influenced modern dance, um, I'm really, curious about how to find the ways, uh, especially in places that are far from my homeland, to appropriately share and get people involved and invested in feeling that heart connection that I think so many people are attracted to in our beautiful, beautiful cultures, um, but in a way that is still respectful and honoring of that culture and has the right sense of um, intention behind it. And it's a really slippery slope, as you all know very, very well. Uh, but that's something that I'm trying to figure out. So the next work that I've started to develop is called Native Intelligence, Innate Intelligence, and looking at the subtle difference between those two words, uh, native and innate, and where they overlap and reside within us, both universally and then uniquely as indigenous peoples. Um, and it's just more questions that I keep uncovering and all of that. So that's sort of what I'm digging into lately. Oh. Dig away, <laughs> dig away. <laughs> Uncover the earth. Moses. My turn? Hello, my kako. Um... I guess what I'm working on right now, I'm, I'm always working on about three or four different projects, but uh, one of the big ones I'm working on is entitled Paniolo. And Paniolo uh, will tell the story of the Hawaiian cowboys, which many people have no idea existed. But before there were the cowboys of the West and that we, you know, we see in the Westerns, there were these group of amazing individuals called the uh, vaqueros, and they came to Hawaii to teach Hawaiians how to... How to um, uh, rope wild cattle that were introduced uh, a number of years before, and so before those Western uh, uh, cowboys that you that we all know of know of, there were M Mexican cowboys and Hawaiian cowboys uh, before all of that, and that's uh, a piece that I'm going to tell. In that's in, in telling of that story, you have to tell um, of this particular event where uh, several Native Hawaiian men, several Kanaka Maoli, went to Wyoming uh, to a a, um, a rodeo, and were, were basically laughed at. This is way back in the in 1800s, and ended up winning first place in one of the biggest rodeos that happened at that time. Kicked everybody's asses, okay? <laughs> now, I guess the reason why I, I gravitate to stories like this, the one that I'm, I'm telling, as well as the story of Duke Hanamoku, which I, is a one-man show that I, I am touring, is uh, I have to go a little bit take it back a little bit and talk, talk a little bit about me, about all this right here. <laughs> this, this weird shaded brown guy that you're looking at, I went to the University of Hawaii. Um, I guess I'm a little too old because I was there before Kumu Haile started with the amazing work that she's doing there. Um, I entered, okay, let's take it back a little bit, even before that, way back to my mom's time. My mother is pure Hawaiian. 
She, um, her grandfather, her father, my grandfather, was born in 1886. So around that time, when all that stuff was happening, where our our language was not allowed, it was illegal. So my my mother grew up in a place called Hana, which is a very remote place where there is a lot of Native Hawaiians, a full blooded Native Hawaiians still, and her first language was Hawaiian. But she was. Um, forbade at a very young age to speak that language. So if you talk to my mother today, she's this beautiful statuesque Hawaiian woman that can barely speak a word of the language. So she grew up without the language, even though that was her first language. Fast forward to when she became a young woman, met this handsome guy from uh, uh, Virginia, got married in um, and lived, raised my myself and my four sisters in Washington DC moved to Hawaii when I was three and so we were a family that although we were native Hawaiian we, we didn't have a strong connection with the language or the culture and I, that's how I grew up fast forward to UH I discovered two things at UH theater and Hawaiian language. That's, my, that's the first taste of Hawaiian language I had really was at the University of Hawaii. And I, I excelled in theater. And then I was done with the theater program and I was out in the world. I'm like, oh, great, what now for this weird shaded brown guy that, want, that is that's pretty good in theater and wants to have a career in acting, what is there for me? There was nothing, right? There was, there was no, you know, there's, there's wonderful roles I could go out for in Shakespeare and all of this and that, and I love doing those things, but really there's nothing that is there for me, for a person who is exploring his identity as this brown person that wants to connect with the language, wants to connect with culture. So I had to create my own stuff. And so I looked for these these people, and we have some amazing heroes in our own stories. Like Kumu Haile says, we, we have our own stories that we, we can tell and we want to tell them. So that's why I focus on on um, these heroes of, of these, these native Hawaiian heroes, first of all, for myself, and also so we can showcase to the next generation that you have these people that we can look you can look to for inspiration, not some other story that you see um, wherever in, in the theater on in the movies and whatnot so and along in a big nutshell that's kind of where i am what i do and how i'm trying to move forward thank you moses <laughs> and then next we have kumu Haile. before we move on we just recognize we do have one of our other haumana from uh university of hawaii manoa elong is here and actually he's doing a play reading tomorrow yes so for every student of kumu Haile too so Aloha, it's nice to see you. Okay. So I feel like I just got done with a bunch of things. Uh, I had a talk today. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, and, and honestly, there's a bunch of projects that just wrapped up. Um, not, not to bring the mouse into the house, yeah, but we just finished the... Um, Moana production in Olalo, Hawaii. So just got done directing that, um, um, which featured Kaipulau Makaniolono as Maui, uh, just to tag that on, I guess. Um, and then we won't go into details about working with the mouse, but um, uh, so there's that. Uh, I, and I did this crazy thing. Um, I went back to school. It's crazy. So, at, you know, at 40, yeah, I decided to go back and do a, a doctorate. So I am finishing that up right now, my doctoral thesis, um, which documents Hanakeaka. And that hopefully will conclude in February. Hopefully I'll be, you know, dean doctor, I don't know, like, Dumbledore for something, whatever it's, you know, whatever, however that works. So I, it was weird after getting my tenure uh, at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, I said, ah, I wouldn't mind maybe being a doctor. There was a lot of, you know, colleagues in my department who tried to really divide those of us with MFAs and PhDs. And I thought to myself, oh, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. I can be a practitioner and be real and apply the knowledge, and I can also go ahead and write the scholarly work and be this academic. So um, I, another motivator behind that was the fact that there is nothing really written 
on, except for in the newspapers. There's no real critical analysis about the work that our kupuna did. So that, that kind of drove me. And then also the need for a text for the courses, the courses that I created that I'm teaching. So also often I'm like giving them handouts of talks I've done or whatever. And I said, hey, would it be nice to have a book? <laughs> so that, that is something that's in the works as well. Um, and then I have syllabi to create for next week because we start the semester. <laughs> So there's those kinds of things. Um, also, uh, supporting my uh, the, the next MFA in Hawaiian theater, Akea Kahikina. Um, his production should come up in 2020. And in 2019, fall of 2019, we have our next main stage production. Um, so like Laie Kavai, this will be the second one. And just one little note about Laie Kavai. That was, that production was the first time anything Hawaiian ever took place, ever transpired on that stage of Kennedy Theater. And like, yeah, like Moses mentioned, because we're, we're students that came out of this program. Yeah, came out of the, the program at Kennedy Theater. There was never a role for us. Never a role for us. So that's also important for us to be writing our stories so that, you know, the next generation or our colleagues, um, our mamo, have something to audition for, yeah? And we're not just put in the ensemble or we're not constantly an understudy for a white role, yeah? Because I did the whole haole thing, yeah? I did the Shakespeare thing because that was the thing to do and it was always disconnected, yeah? But you know, that was the training. So you come through the program, you do that training, you can do UNESCO, you can do Sheridan, you can do all this white stuff, yeah, the Howley stuff. But then there's still something empty here. And so, like a gathering like this, I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> But, you know, that's what it's about, and that's been the motivation. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what's going on. I'm writing the next production for Main Stage, and um, can't release any information yet about the theme because there's been all these different things coming, and I, um, I feel like our kupuna, they're, they're really interesting. Our ancestors, they're so interesting. They leave crumbs on a bread trail. Yeah, and you follow those crumbs. And then sometimes in a dream, something comes. And then you go, oh, that's why that piece of bagel was there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then we're able to thread it together like a lay. And when that threading comes together, we have our work. So, yeah, mahalo. Mahalo, mahalo. Mahalo, cool. The next question I have for you folks is, what is most important to you in your work? What is the takeaway for either yourself or for the audience? Something that's important to me is, uh, I think of three things. One is inspired by something you just said, which is a, about a lack of critical discourse, informed critical discourse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important to me that because I grew up on the continent and I live on the continent and I have an opportunity to share some stories and some insight into things Hawaiian with audiences that may not necessarily have the opportunity to be exposed to those things and to learn about something different or new to share that. But then it's very challenging. When we premiered Pohaku in Washington, D.C. in March of 2016, the Washington Post review of it said, a hip-shaking evocation of Hawaii's last queen. And I was like, really? You had to talk about the hips of all the things. And then a whole paragraph was dedicated to how the writer, after having seen three things about our last queen, still could not pronounce her name. They dedicated a paragraph, not even talking about the work yet. Yeah. 
And it was so offensive, <laughs> as you know, as you know. So I think how to foster critical discourse that's informed or just hopefully have people engaged in mindful conversation if they aren't informed. So that's something more with um, my directors had at Dance Place and as someone who has an opportunity to create um, situations for others that I'm really interested in fostering. Um, but from my own work, you know, that work was very challenging to make because I think I was commissioned by my ancestors to make something that told a story to people who didn't know our story. However, it's also been viewed by Hawaiians a lot. It's performed, uh, been performed on three of the islands in five different venues over the past couple of years. And so we had to create something that was still um, hopefully meaningful and it provided a connection to Kanaka Maoli and still then reach people that didn't know anything about our people um, and our history. So I hope that an audience can leave with an opportunity to see themselves reflected, whether they are Hawaiian or not. And then for myself, um, the biggest journey, you know, when I first met Moses, it was on the research for this. Back then, he was working at the Bishop Museum still. He gave me and some of my collaborators from the continent a beautiful tour of the museum. And then we sat in his office with one of the musicians that you'll see in here on Wednesday and Thursday. And he shared all these Hawaiian instruments that were hidden in this office with us. It was really beautiful and meaningful, especially when I think back now, how I've known you all these years in different ways. Um, but... I met so much resistance, not from him, but from other people in the early stages of the research of this work, other Hawaiians who were skeptical of my intentions. Understandably so, given all that's happened to us as a people. Um, very understandably so. However, um, how to toe the line between what I am reflecting of my people and then um, maybe providing my slightly different insight so with that, what I have to take away from myself is making sure that I'm being honest. And sometimes that might mean that um, I meet with some disapproval from all kinds of different people. But if I know, if I've done my due diligence and I can sit with it in my own heart, then that's okay. And that was really hard to get to, right, Kumu? <laughs> We had to work and sweat and cry a lot over all of this. But then we got to that place, and that's what's important for me and leaving the work for myself. I think that um, what, what I hope to do with the work that, that I create, uh, several things, um, I hope that it educates. And I think that's needed now more than ever. We had, we had an amazing march just yesterday on the streets of Chicago about the Aloha Poke um, thing. If you don't know what that is, please Google it because there's another rally tomorrow. We could use your support in that. Um, but it all stems around someone just not being educated on what it is that we do. So I hope that um, the, the work that I create educates, and if, if you're not, like, like Christopher said, if, you're not, if you don't know, then, then find out, go do the research, or, or engage in conversation with the artists if you're able to, because that's, that's when our work really has, has the impact that we want. Um, and also, the work that I create, I hope that it um, inspires people to continue to uh, explore their identity, because that's what I'm still doing when I'm creating my work. And people that are familiar with the stories that I, that I put on stage, I hope that we're able to engage in conversations about the work that I do and question each other. Like last night, if you saw one of the pieces that I, I, I wrote, it's, um, it was a, I, we, made, we took one of our Akua, one of our, our deities, the, the Hina, uh, who's called the goddess of the moon, and I made her into a rock star. And I hope that other, other Hawaiians feel comfortable enough to come to me and talk about, okay, what, 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 why'd you do that, you know? <laughs> why'd you tell that story the way that you told it? Because with, in Hawaii, of the mo'o level that we have, there are, we have eight different islands, and we have many different um, uh, ahupua'a, many different moku on the different islands. And so there are many different ways to, there are many different versions of one story. 
And what I have to tell myself when I'm creating these pieces is that you're going to piss somebody off. Because somebody from Molokai knows a different version of the story, and you're going to tell it in a way you, you can't please everyone. And I think that's okay, but I think what needs to happen is we all need to come together and talk, to, talk with each other and, be, and, and have this conversation between each other. We, you have on stage right here three, three Hawaiians that we're all in, involved in, in performance and theater and dance, but we, we're in different places, I think. And I think it's important for us to have, continue to have these conversations. And I hope that the work that I create sparks and you know, just a conversation between, between both us as Native Hawaiians and those, those viewing the work that, that, that I put on stage. All right, that's all I got to say. This one long enough, yeah. Okay. Um, so I kind of want to say diddle. Yeah. <laughs> to keep it short, diddle. Uh, absolutely uh, educate, entertain. Because I think part in entertainment, we can educate and we don't have to knock people over the head. Yeah. And actually, when someone feels elevated and uh, enlightened um, in the form of entertainment, they actually take away more. If you're enjoying it, you take away more. You like the class, you're gonna learn so much more about it, right? Same thing with a performance. Um, so that, the awareness that we actually exist, that's kind of a big one. Actually, Olelo Hawaii exists, yeah? Kanaka Maoli exists, so that's one thing putting us on the map. And definitely the language, that's also one of the primary goals of the work that we do. Um, but inspiring our fellow Kanaka and our fellow sisters and brothers of other nations, yeah, of other indigenous um, backgrounds. That's, that's core to the work that we do. Because at some, at some point, we're all able to collectively plug in. We're collectively, we plug in to this understanding of what is Pono, yeah, what is righteous or right for our people, yeah? Our stories being told. And so we share that as, a, as, as theater artists, as indigenous peoples. And I think to continue to foster that is also one of the goals of the work. And I just, I just wanna look back this way and say, I would love to do a show with the three of you. <laughs> I would love to create some. This would be awesome. A dream team of sorts. Yeah, okay, sorry, I had to do that. I'm getting all excited sitting over here. Okay. All right, so we just have a few more minutes left. Um, so if you could leave a message for the entire conference, just one sentence, or, or if you had one dream, like you had a million dollars, what would those three things that you could do with that to promote this, this conference, this work that we do? And just, yeah. Can the next one be in Hawaii? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And I say that, I say that for, for, for partly a selfish reason is that, you know, we're, we're the Hawaiian theater, Hanakeaka, what we're doing as Hawaiians is, it's pretty new. And I would love to um, just uh, get a few more resources in to help us build what it is that we're already building. So if we have this the next one in Hawaii, I think it'll be mutual beneficial, mutually beneficial <laughs> to all of us. So, yeah. Kata, thank you. <laughs> we'll start the fundraising tonight at the Drag Bingo. <laughs> It might not be a round trip ticket, but you can at least get there. <laughs> uh, mm. S I think you said something about, I'm so curious about how um, the stakes are so much higher for all of us as marginalized people, as immigrant communities as part of diasporas, as anything other than the default of whiteness. You can have one really good hit show and then everyone looks at the second one with a f exponentially more critical eye. 
Yeah, I mean, everyone's looking for the second slump, right, for anybody, but it's just exponentially more critical. So if I had infinite resources, it would be to create the space where we can have artistic failure because that's so important to grow as artists. Um, yeah, that's what I would wish for us, the space to get in the mud and get dirty because that's where growth happens. I like to get dirty. <laughs> A drag bingo. I was thinking the lo'i, but <laughs> yeah, the tarot patch. If we host this in Hawaii, we can have a day trip, yeah. Um, but the, the same thing came to my mind when I was delivering this this morning was, why doesn't the University of Hawaii at Manoa host something like this? That was rolling in my mind, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, million dollars, we can all go, yeah? <laughs> Yeah, no, <laughs> you said a million. Because a million can't build a theater today, which is unfortunate. Um, but it can definitely uh, support networking. It can definitely support um, people having the opportunity to be in a space. And, you know, we are so used to just being fed. Yeah? We're just, main thing, there's food, we'll go, we'll perform. <laughs> we do it for aloha. Would it, you know, a dream though, a dream is that we have professional theater in Hawaii. That has been a dream of mine. And um, currently I'm collaborating with one of my former Haumana students to get a, a, a television series off in Olelo, Hawaii. Um, but I want, I want to see the opportunity. So when people come through our programs or people decide, I want to be an actor, I want to be a director, I want to be a playwright, they can stay home. Oh. Moses brought this up about you know, wanting to do theater and not having those opportunities at home. So I hope in some way that we can build a foundation for that, that we can build professional theater, um, and, you know, maybe not adhere to the Screen Actors Guild and make our own union. Yeah? yeah? Why can't we have our own union? I think we can. Yeah, where we create the, the paradigm and we create the scale and all of, all of those questions, all of those logistics in having a union. Um, so those are bigger visions, bigger ideas. Yeah, but mahalo again, mahalo for inviting us to be at the table, to have this opportunity to discuss with you and to share with you. Um, it means a lot, it really means a lot to be here. So um, I'm sure I'm speaking for all of us who made the journey over Nakai Evalu, yeah, our eight C's. <laughs> mahalo. So we are going to finish up. We're all pow here. Thank you, everyone on the panel, for sharing your mo'olelo, your stories, your history, um, the love for theater and to dance. And to everyone, we look forward to working with you this entire weekend. Um, if you want to meet them later and ask them more pressing questions, please poke them, not pokey them. <laughs> poke them for questions. And not the other kind of pork, which we'll do later tonight <laughs> after the drag bingo. <laughs> Porking. <laughs> so to Kata, thank you, and to everyone, and to our panelists. Mahalo. Hi everyone, thank you so much again to Coco Chandelier, Christopher, Moses, and Tammy, thank you. One more round of applause, please. Oh. It's uh, been already a great opening last night and today at uh, this plenary. Um, I am with Joan Osato. We are the co-chair yes. yes. of the steering so committee. The steering yes. committee. We finish each other's sentences now. <laughs> we want to just offer you a few announcements as we go into the next se uh, session. Um, 
Uh, you will see you have the newspaper that gives you the uh, program for today. But we also encourage you to keep looking on the website at the, uh, at the schedule because as we do, as people of color and because of the paradigms we're in, we are responsive in our revolutionary acts. So today, we adjusted the plenary because we wanted to make sure we were inclusive and we were learning that we had beautiful native and indigenous guests and uh, locals here that could come together and open our plenary in the most beautiful way. So we thank you for that flexibility and that's called decolonizing the space. Uh, yes, so thank you. We'll be doing that throughout. Uh, so that means today our first breakout session will start at 11.15 and go to 12.45. And then the, you'll have a, a, a few minutes break and the second breakout session will start at 1 o'clock and go till 2.30. And I understand that the refreshments are still out in the lobby, so grab and go, please. Um, and then we have a very special session today uh, with Kumu Vicky uh, Holt. Uh, Takamine, who is in from Hawaii. And we went to a community gathering where she taught us the Hawaiian chants for the political actions. So at 2.30 today on the fifth floor, in room 549, she will be there again to teach us those chants, to lead us. So that tomorrow, we have another special opportunity, an important opportunity, to participate in the political action. So uh, we will once again um, shift the schedule tomorrow and uh, the uh, breakout sessions, the second breakout session will start later at 1.30. And I'll give this information to our front desk. You can keep referring and we'll see if we can get it on the website too. That will help you uh, to keep referring to the schedule as it, we get it current. So that political action tomorrow on Wednesday will happen from 1.30 to 2.30, no, I'm sorry, 12.30 to 1.30, right down the street here at Aloha Poke Company. It's a peaceful rally led by our local Native Hawaiians. So we wanted to give us the opportunity to uh, participate in that revolutionary act. Um, right, so again, I'll, put, I'll make sure we have the schedule available to you. With that, I want to share the microphone with John Osato. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so one, one thing is that I just want to do a few housekeeping notes and let you know that um, please pull up your schedules like on your smartphones and everything because all the room numbers, everything is on there um, in terms of the sessions that you want to attend today. And then just to go into the afternoon, um, acquittal, um, the the performance will be at Victory Gardens at 3.30. Um, 8 p.m. Uh, we have Embedded over at Victory Gardens right down the street. And then at 9.30, of course, um, with the lovely Coco Chandelier, uh, we have Drag Bingo. And that's going to finish off our night um, of the official part. Yes. OK. Um, all right. Uh, Oh, Thank you. And, oh, drag bingo is literally almost next door to Victory Gardens at Fiesta Mexicana. So yay, just roll out, ride it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, so um, thank you for being a part of this plenary session. And um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go out and do it. <laughs> do it. Make the revolution happen as you see fit. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. Participants who were with us today, could you please stay for a photo? We want to get a group photo with you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to our breakout session leaders who have been flexible to roll with uh, our schedule changes. Have great sessions, everybody. We'll see you throughout the day and the evening.